Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we dig into controversies on campus as Title IX sex tribunals and attempts to censor politically incorrect professors royal the ivy-covered walls. In the second half of our show, we'll speak with suspended political science professor John McAdams from Marquette University, which is threatening to revoke his tenure over his persistent blogging in support of free speech. Up first, retired Judge Nancy Gertner from Harvard Law School joins us to explain why she and 28 of her colleagues signed a letter protesting Harvard's new sexual harassment policies put in place to fend off increased pressure from the Obama administration's Title IX enforcers. Judge, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. You were a federal judge for 17 years, appointed by Bill Clinton, and a, and a notable criminal defense lawyer before that. In your memoirs, you describe yourself as an unrepentant feminist. Right. What does that mean? Well, it means that I did not believe that I had, you know, a lobotomy when I got on the bench. In other words, I didn't pretend that suddenly 24 years of civil rights and criminal defense practice had been obliterated mm. the minute that I took the oath. I understood what I had believed in. I continued to believe in those things. But I spent 17 years uh, trying to understand the difference between you know, my opinions before and my position before and what the, the job demanded. Mm -hmm. And so it was for me, it was a struggle. I, I didn't change my views. I still had them. I have them now. But I struggled with the role, and it was a very explicit and ongoing struggle in me. Judge, your interest in seeking justice for victims of what used to be called date rape is very well established, and, and I recommend to our listeners that they Google up your American Prospect article titled Sex, Lies, and, and Justice. It does a great job with a very complex issue. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes defining the problem we face on, on campus. Feminist advocates, including President Obama, claim that one in five college women has been raped. What do you make of that claim? Well, I think that it's a question of how one defines it. In my article, I cite to a uh, similar kind of study that was done on the MIT campus. And it was a very, very high percentage who, who at least one interprets as having been raped. But when you ask them about how many of them had, how many of these the women mm. had sex after drinking, it was a huge amount. Mm -hmm. And likewise, if you asked how many of them believed that sex after drinking was rape, the numbers declined substantially. In other words, they didn't interpret impaired mm -hmm. sex as, as rape. rape. So the question is, what's the definition? We all can agree on the violence accompanying it. We all can agree on sex with someone who's completely unconscious. We might disagree more about sex under circumstances where both parties are impaired and impair themselves. That's really a very different category. For me, it's a question of what the definition is. It may well be yucky and uncomfortable and, and not great to have sex under those circumstances, mm -hmm. but whether we call it rape is another question. In a court of law outside the campus, where do they draw the line? In Massachusetts, in, in many states, it was against her will, and certainly the circumstances of the sex would bear on whether or not one could prove that the sex was against her will. There are no clear lines with respect to that. But typically, cases of impairment wouldn't have even been brought. Mm. Wouldn't have even, even been charges? brought. So do we have a campus rape culture crisis or a campus rape culture hysteria crisis? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I certainly I am shocked by the stories that we have read about in the papers. I'm shocked by the fraternity, gang rape, you know, sort of rituals, horrible rituals. Yeah, but those are apocryphal. I don't think anyone's some actually... Some are. Some, we don't know. There certainly have been, one, you know, the, the University of Virginia one had some questions. But that was shown to be a fraud. That's right, but, but one doesn't know about others. Hmm. I think that the only... The only position to take with respect to this is not is, is to say we don't know. We know that there are many women who certainly believe that that's the case, who certainly perceive that's the mm. case. But I'm not willing to say that it isn't. I just don't know is the answer. I don't know the answer. And, and to some degree, it's the ambiguities of the situation that call for changes in the way we adjudicate these claims. In other words, it's exactly because it's ambiguous. It's exactly because some sex takes place under circumstances mm -hmm. which are unclear, that we have to be cautious about how we, uh, you know, how we go about dealing with claims of someone having been raped. Well, gee, you sound like an impartial judge. <laughs> well, I'm, I, you know what you're hearing? You're hearing 
what the article reflects, which is on the one hand, you know, unlike my partner, Harvey Silverglade, we fight, fought about this for the years that we were in practice together. I did believe that rape was a very special kind of crime. It mm-hmm. was uniquely, made a woman feel uniquely vulnerable. In the my memoir, I write about, you know, I mean, I was never thankfully mm-hmm. raped, but I remember once coming back from college, standing on the platform, uh, the subway platform, dressed to the nines, feeling incredibly strong, and someone came up to me, a group of kids come up to me, push me around, touch my breasts, and run away. And it was like, yeah, it awful. was like a moment of, oh my God, you know, I'm just reduced to my biology. Mm. So I, I, or the dentist, you woke up with his hands all over you. I mean, we, I understood, you know, that women felt uniquely, I felt uniquely vulnerable to this crime. By the same token, I was a criminal defense lawyer, and I knew what an unjust accusation right. could bring. On that point, tell us briefly the story of Paul. I refused to represent men who were accused of rape, not because I didn't think they deserved a defense, but because I was doing other things and it was not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the friend of a friend, tells me that he had sex with a young woman, that 10 months later he hears through the grapevine that she's accusing him of having raped her. A month after they had had sex, just a month after mm-hmm. they had had sex, uh, she invited him to her parents' house for the weekend. The evidence was inconsistent with rape mm-hmm. um, in terms of what other people saw, in terms of what her affect was. I still decided I didn't want to represent him. My partner would represent him. And what happened? He was convicted in a judge trial. The lawyer who was then representing him decided to waive the jury because there were all these TV programs about date rape. Mm-hmm. I took over the appeal, and I took over the appeal because I was very troubled that a case like this could have gotten that far, that the prosecutor didn't feel that he had the authority or legitimacy to turn down the case, even when it was not strong. Hmm. I learned later on even the grand jury uh, decided to err on the side of indicting, even when they had serious doubts about it. And then when the case came to the judge, who was... uh, this was jury wave, so the judge was the only decision maker. When it came to him, he literally gave a speech that that, that suggested so strongly that he said I, he had no choice but to convict because he didn't want to be criticized. Wow! So I was I was chilled by all of this. I drafted a brief. The case, the conviction was finally overturned, but it it, it affected me. It made me realize that. The criminal justice system in any adjudicative process is imperfect. And after you took this case, you were denounced and picketed by feminists. How, how did that feel? About as bad as anything I can remember. Um, it, you know, I had spent my life doing women's rights work, and there was a panel at Harvard on something or other. It wasn't even about this issue, and mm-hmm. suddenly there were pickets that appeared at the end talking about me as a so-called feminist. It was very troubling personally, but more even per, quite apart from personally, it was terribly troubling because it suggested that there was no, how shall I say it, there was no nuance. There was no concern here about process and rights and fairness. In your article, you say when you explain that you really believed that the accused was innocent, a demonstrator yelled, that's irrelevant. Right. Wow. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, that's right. But it was you know, now to some degree, I was a political person before I went on the bench, and I understood that sometimes in order to redress a wrong, you go too far in one direction. Mm-hmm. I mean, that essentially you feel like there have been years and years and years of silence about rape, years and years of passivity about it, and so to some degree the you rhetoric... You need to shake things up. You overdo the rhetoric in that direction mm-hmm. because you want to make sure... You want to make sure that you're heard. I say this in the article. It's almost as if you have to speak more loudly to be heard. I understand that. The question is, what's the limit of it? What's the point at which you say this really is a bridge too far? Well, it's tough in this climate to be an advocate of nuance. Right, right. But you would imagine that colleges and universities ought to be. So, Judge, what is Title IX and how are its demands enforced? Title IX actually is probably the most, I think, is is the singular achievement of the women's movement of my generation. And so it basically, it was a statute that enforced 
equal opportunity non-discrimination on college campuses. Mm-hmm. Mostly for sports teams, I remember it when it first not, came out. It was out. for all sorts of things. I mean, it essentially, the, the requirement of non-discrimination of equality led to equality in the provision of sports equipment and the provision mm-hmm. of resources for men's and women's sports teams. But also one of, one side of it was the notion that women can't feel fully equal in an educational environment if they are discriminated against. Discrimination included sexual harassment and clearly included violence as well. It's a trivial point to say that you can't fully participate in an educational institution if you are feeling threatened sure. in any way. And how are Title IX regulations enforced? How are colleges punished if they violate Title IX? They're, they're enforced by the Department of Education, mm-hmm. the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education. And unlike a lawsuit where, you know, an individual may get money, here what hangs on the balance with colleges and universities is their federal funding. Hmm. So that if they don't comply with the requirements of Title IX, they could lose their federal funding, which is gigantic for these institutions. So this is like states who refuse to lower their driving speed limit to 55 lose their highway bill money. It's something like that, but this is really the entire institution. This is overhead and mm-hmm. uh, in, in the elite grants, institutions. Research grants, Pell grants. In the elite institutions, you're talking about a huge amount of money. Basic science research, a uh, huge amount of so money. It's, a it's quite penalty. a big carrot, or quite a big stick, rather. Does that ever happen to a college? Interestingly, not, no. Hmm. But what was significant about the new administration in the Department of Education, the Office of Civil Rights, was that for the very first time, they began to make noises about defunding institutions, much more serious, mm-hmm. much more sustained, more than anyone else had done before. The latest controversy seems to have been kicked off by some sort of an enforcement letter. Can you describe that? In 2011, there was a Dear Colleague letter, which went around to all the institutions, all the institutions that had federal funds, indicating the department's seriousness in, in enforcing the rules against sexual harassment and rape, indicating in that and in speeches that Catherine Lehman, who was the head of the, uh, mm-hmm. the Office of Civil Rights dealing with these issues, in a speech that she gave, she made it quite clear that however much the reputation of the of the office had been for a paper tiger before, that that was not going to be the case going forward, that, that they could they would really take into account and conceivably defund institutions that did not uh, do something, did not comply with the requirements of Title IX. So this has resulted in setting up of Title IX tribunals in campuses across the country to adjudicate accusations of rape. There had always been tribunals. That's ah. not complete. There had always been, right, you think about in college campuses, there had always been disciplinary proceedings dealing with, you know, alcohol in the dorms, mm-hmm. even accusations of assault. Now the, the question was making these proceedings, these tribunals, conform to sort of the, the new requirements of Title IX, the new, not so much new requirements, but the new attention to Title IX. These are not specialized tribunals. Well, they had, there had always been tribunals on this subject. There's no question, however, that the sexual assault controversy led people to believe that the ordinary tribunals were not good enough and you had to create specialized tribunals with some sensitivity to these issues because the ordinary tribunals, women said, were not doing the trick, that men were being exonerated under circumstances than they shouldn't be, that punishments were less than they ought to be. So it was not a question of creating new tribunals. It was a question of reconstituting them to meet the new requirements uh, of Title IX. And under these new requirements, are the laws and regulations symmetrical with respect to gender, or are women afforded additional rights, privileges, and protections that are not afforded to men? The rules are different across the country. The one that I'm familiar with at Harvard, for example, is that they are not symmetrical, at least in one situation. If both parties were impaired by drink, Mm -hmm. then the man could be held responsible, and the woman was characterized as a victim. So let's say they're equally impaired, they Mm -hmm. both went about that impairment the same way, and then one, the, if the woman's impairment basically makes her a victim, the man's impairment nevertheless characterizes him as a perpetrator, even though he was impaired as well. How does that asymmetry stand up, given the fact that we're supposed to have equal protection under the law? Well, um, these are private institutions. Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, one can characterize um, uh, the 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 
you know, equal equal treatment under the law uh, is not it's not the same treatment. One can look at different victims differently. One can certainly argue that different victims are differently situated, and that whatever the social mores of the time are, uh, women are not similarly situated as men. And in a situation like this, when the man is having sex with her and she doesn't know what she's doing, then then you can look at her situation differently. That's not a great answer. In the criminal law, for example, we are actually ambivalent about how to deal with alcohol Hmm. and responsibility. In some situations, someone being drunk or impaired could diminish their responsibility and others it would not. Hmm. So here, these institutions were saying that a man should his impairment shouldn't stand in the way of his being held responsible. The equal protection is a little complicated because these are private institutions enforcing private uh, private, private uh, law. codes. The Office of Civil Rights is not saying make different rules for men and women. The Office of Civil Rights is saying make a robust sexual assault code and these private institutions are then responding in this way. So the authority of the Constitution is is not clear, is what I'm saying. Judge, did you ever get a chance to read a Heather McDonald article titled Neo-Victorianism on Campus? No. You should read it. She argues that the sexual liberation movement is having a nervous breakdown in our colleges. What she talks about is the collision between binge drinking, the hookup culture, and sex week courses that turn college into one big bacchanalia. And and the way Heather sees it, there's almost been a puritanical backlash demanding that affirmative consent be obtained at every step of the lovemaking process in a form that would stand up to a he said, she said accusation years later. How do we square these two things? It is a reaction. There's no question about it. I think the answer is that we swing back in all, back and forth in both directions. On the one hand, there was free love and women owning their own sexuality, Mm -hmm. being autonomous creatures and being able to say what they want. On the other hand, these statements of autonomy take place in a world in which there is still inequality, in which women still feel pressure and still feel um, that they feel obliged to have sex under circumstances when they otherwise wouldn't. Hmm. That's really true. So the two things collide with one another, and and we swing back and forth. Uh, when I was in college, we, it was a big deal that they got rid of what they called parietal right, which were rules, you know, limiting whether you, a man could be in your room and when you had to come home. We totally smashed that to smithereens. Do you think that'll come back? I think that this is actually a version of that. I mean, when you see, for example, the limitations in Dartmouth on the hard liquor, it's suddenly now, we, we focused on the adjudicative process on hearings on the one hand. Now people are going back and focusing on conduct. On the other, which is, it seems to me, a return to parietals. But it's really the, the, it's the complexity of the situation. I have a right to do anything with my body that I want on the one hand. On the other hand, I live in a world in which there are pressures on women that are not the same as on men. I live in a culture of inequality. How do you meld the two together? There are ways in which these new rules on sexual assault are enormously paternalistic towards women, take away women, this, women as an agent. I mean, the notion that she mm-hmm. has to be specially protected in these proceedings. On the other hand, you know, they clearly are, it's t- still not an equal situation. So in one sense, she does have to be protected in these proceedings. Well, college administrators are struggling with this, of course, under risk of losing all their federal funding. You surprised people by signing a letter along with 28 other Harvard law professors opposing Harvard's new sexual assault policies. What are the issues? The issue is really whether or not Harvard went too far. What I bring to this debate, and you said it a moment ago, you know, I was sounding very judge-like. I do think it's a problem. I do think colleges have to come to grips with this. I do think the question is, how do we deal with it, and what are the fair processes to deal with it? I have no problem thinking that it's an important problem and an important issue. The question is how one deals with it. And the Harvard policy really went too far. There were no hearings. Mm-hmm. It was entirely in one office. That office was the Title IX office, the very same office that threatens people with losing their funding. Mm-hmm. Um, there were rights afforded to the victim that were not afforded to the accused. There was no place for lawyers. In so many ways, it went really much further than it had to go. Now, that doesn't mean that the appropriate response is to turn every college hearing into a full-blown 
jury trial, you know, the functional equivalent of what you'd get in court, I agree that it's a different Mm -hmm. process. But there was really nothing remotely resembling a fair process about what Harvard came down with. And all we were saying is, you have gone too far in these particulars. Under Harvard's current policy, aside from celibacy, what's the most effective way for a well-behaved, non-rapist man to protect himself from the risk of false accusations? Do the right thing. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, there's no way to protect any of us from the risk of false accusations. But I'm not, I, I, I want to roll that back a little bit. I'm really not of the view that false accusations are taking place all the time. I mean, we've now had some celebrated examples of that. But my support for this letter and my concern about Harvard was not because I believed that there were false accusations all the time. I believed that there had to be these protections even if that happens once in 20 years. Mm. That was the experience that I went through in Paul's case. So this is a backstop for anyone. I was also concerned that if we didn't have processes that looked legitimate and were legitimate, that there would be a backlash. Mm, Which is happening. Yeah, there would be a backlash. What advice would you give a college-age son about drunk sex? Well... You know, it's interesting. I have, they're in their 20s now, but I have had two sons of college age at the same time. I mean, I think that you, the the answer has to be in how you treat women and, and with the kind of respect that you give them. I don't think it's a bad thing if you pause and make sure that what you're doing is fairly agreed upon by everyone. I don't think that that's a bad thing to pause. I don't think that it really, you know, it introduces contractual relationships in sex. It's not a bad thing to be concerned that your partner is fully on board with what you guys are about to do. That's not a bad thing. What is a bad thing is that if she wakes up in the morning having fully consented and thinks the better of it and then accuses you of something you didn't do, that's a bad thing. Not just in the morning, but how about a year later after a breakup? Right. That's a bad thing. That's not a good, that's not a good thing. There's no question about it. And for times like that, which I don't think happen all the time, there has to be a fair process. Markets have a way of compensating for overregulation. There's a there's a new meme making its way around social media recommending that in order to avoid any risk of being dragged in front of a Title IX sex tribunal, college boys should never date girls from their own college. <laughs> what do you make of that? I think it's silly. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's I think it's an overreaction in its own way. You know, in talking to some of the friends of my kids, I said, don't you think this is a problem and do you worry about it? And they said to me, which was quite wonderful, we don't worry about it because we're careful to make sure that what we do is agreed to. I don't think that that's a bad thing. I really don't. If it has changed behavior in that way, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's the issue of what happens when, when, you know, the sex goes bad and somebody makes an accusation that doesn't make sense under the circumstances. That's when things are are wrong. But you're not going to get me to say either that I don't think it's a problem because the answer is I think it is a problem. I don't know the scope of the problem because I don't know how rape is defined. Do colleges have to deal with it in some way? Yes. They didn't want to be in loco parentis. That was the name for, Mm -hmm. you know, having colleges essentially substitute for parents. But to all intents and purposes, they are dealing with the results of parents not being around. They have to deal with it some way. The bottom line is they have to deal with it in a way that is fair. I don't mind the concern about uh, about reinstituting rules, like the rule about hard liquor in Dartmouth, uh, even the rule in the, that, that Harvard faculty about not having sex between faculty and students. Oh, sure. We could also bring back parietal chaperones. We can go back to the 50s. I don't think that we have to go all the way back to the 50s. I think to all intents and purposes... We're going back part of the way. There's no question about it. So, Judge, is there hope for the future that we're going to settle this out in a reasonable way? I think that there is because the debate has become a much richer debate now, today, than it had been a year ago. The University of Pennsylvania law faculty Mm -hmm. just signed a letter very similar to the letter that we've signed, which which simply says, you know, you have to make sure these processes are fair. Mm -hmm. Men are beginning to speak out. Men are beginning to speak out in a way that, frankly, they should about accusations that were made against them. Women should continue to speak out, and hopefully out of this debate will come procedures and 
standards of behavior which will be good. Well, Judge, thanks for coming on the show, and thanks for being an advocate of fairness and nuance. Okay, thank you. That was Judge Nancy Gertner from Harvard Law School here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Check us out on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And stop by realclearpolitics.com, one of America's top political websites. Ahead, Professor John McAdams from Marquette University explains why he was run off campus and is in danger of having his tenure revoked for his unrepentant advocacy and blogging of conservative causes.